Welcome everybody to Monday Night Live, the first edition in September. I'm delighted to be back with you all and thanks so much for joining, whether you're listening to this on, uh, on the podcast oh. channel or whether you're listening to this on, <coughs> or watching this on YouTube. Somebody hasn't got their uh, uh, microphone muted or perhaps I even forgot to, uh, forgot to mute everybody. I think I did, so uh, that's my fault. Everyone's muted now, so we should be all systems go. We've got a great lineup of uh, speakers in the autumn uh, session and I've been assisted by uh, one or two people, Tim, Nigel, and if anybody else has got uh, someone we think we ought to get onto the show, then we're going to go for it because I didn't believe that Nigel would be able to persuade Marcus Dimbleby to come on, but Nigel had absolutely no problem in doing it and I'll let Nigel explain that a little bit later. So the objectives of Monday Night Live is to be informative, inspirational and energizing and giving us all a chance to recharge, review, refresh, and more importantly, have fun because people learn, relearn and pass things on to other people by having fun. Uh, virtually everybody on here, I think everybody is a lifelong learner, change is constant, and so we all really have to be up for it. And wisdom, of course, is forever. I've been looking at a few things that I've been doing looking back on them and I've been surprised on some of the issues that I think are obvious are not obvious to the people that I've been mentoring coaching and being the trusted advisor over the last uh, five weeks one of them is mind mapping now I'm a consummate mind mapper and there's a typical Derek mind map and when I say mind mapping they say oh no can you run a program and show us how to do it I don't know how to mind map. So I'm just going to remind everybody, because I think you might want to remind the people you work with uh, or coach or mentor how to mind map. And how to mind map is you need uh, an A A4 piece of paper or an A3 piece of paper like that with the subject in the middle, landscape, use capitals. And the benefit of mind mapping is it gives you the opportunity to get everything down on one piece of paper but really it's the recall in an exam situation, in a speech situation, in a typical difficult negotiation situation. The second thing is speed reading. I thought kind of everyone knew how to speed read. Do they? Heck, most people still think getting a business book like this, and I got this delivered to me yesterday, Banished Burnout Toolkit by Janice Litvin, and you'll hear from Janice in a minute. And, uh, my goal will be to speed read it in about half an hour using my fingers reading very fast and there's also uh, i was talking to amy about it there's also uh, something which people call photo reading where you literally turn each page and it's been proven that these techniques work because the uh, brain's so clever it can take so much information in whereas the eyes move slowly across the page and the other issue is another favorite of mine that i had to uh, point out to two people during August is the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of what we do provides 20% of the results and 20% of what we do provides 80% of the results. And that was Wilfredo Prato in the, in the 19th century, an Italian economist who noticed that 80% of the assets in Italy were in the hands of 20% of the people. And so what, um, what can we learn from that? We can learn that we need to be effective and efficient and really focused when, we, um, when we're teaching people, when we're working ourselves, when we're trying to get uh, so many things done. And I was reading in the Sunday Times yesterday that the most stressful thing people have these days, and I didn't believe it, but that's what it said, are to-do lists. They can't, they look at their to-do list and they get so stressed out, they've got so many things to do on their to-do list that they uh, screw it up and uh, perhaps don't do anything. And of course, there's some tricks with to-do lists as well. You know, do the do the first, do a few quick things first to get momentum. Just like in sport, any momentum is uh, it helps us speed things on. And one of the sales tips I heard very early on in my uh, selling career was once you close the sale, get on with the next sale as quick as you can because while you've got that uh, that uh, momentum. So they were the things that I really wanted to mention that surprised me. 
And of course, it's called the curse of knowledge and Google the curse of knowledge by all means. And it will show that when people like us know something, we assume for some crazy reason that everybody else knows it. And we feel a bit patronizing telling them about it. Whereas in fact, we should be saying something like this. And this is what I tend to do if I'm on stage or, or, or with, a, with a group of fairly mature people. I say something like, now you all do know the 80-20 rule, don't you? Now that's a question followed by, that's a statement followed by a yes tag question. I look at the body language and everybody goes sort of a little nod, which is as much as a no. And if they say, yeah, we do know, that's fine. But then I'm, I've got a license, haven't I, at that point to explain the 80-20 rule. So just a few thoughts from me, a few surprises from me. And now I'm going to turn to uh, some, of, um, some of my friends that have been on the show from the beginning, the 23rd of March, and just ask them if they've got a tip for us. And I will start with Chris Cooper, because I know, Chris, uh, you're, you've, got to, uh, you've got to leave. But I wanted to congratulate you on behalf of everybody for 10 years of your, um, your business elevation show. And it was the 10-year anniversary last week and Chris I wanted to ask you what did you learn from those 10 years or from your your uh, your experience last uh, last week wow thank you that's um <clears throat> what did I learn from 10 years gosh that's uh, a big a big question I think um what did I learn I think um I learned to be more interesting the more interested sorry than interesting with people um Gentleman called Mark, Marshall Sh uh, Thurber shared that with me, and I think uh, just that that element of, of presence with people, being being there for them, listening intently, asking great great questions, I think uh, that makes a difference. You know, if every we, we go through a threshold, every conversation, every every podcast, every uh, webinar that we attend, we're at our best. You know, every moment with our family, with our kids, you know, that has the opportunity to really kind of replenish your life, really. I've learned through the show that you can be both kind and you can be commercial. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, really encouraging in, the, in this world. And I've met many people who are, I think are like that. I've learned that you've got to seek the truth um, and, and try and get a sense of what really is happening um, and take the time to, to study things, learn things, but also make sure you don't get caught up. There's so many people out there trying to take a, a share of your subconscious mind at the moment when it comes to things like vaccines, et cetera. Yeah, just sort of take a little, little bit of care. I've learned to seek my inner wisdom. So I do, uh, over those 10 years, I did learn to meditate. I found that really helpful, which I probably would have laughed at maybe before then. Yeah, Derek. One more, one more, last one, Chris. Okay, sorry, uh, I didn't realise I was on, on time. I lost time. No, I'm sorry, I didn't brief you. No, 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 sorry. I thought, you asked me a big question though. What I learned in 10 years? So uh, <laughs> I think probably, uh, um, ask, ask briefer questions. That's probably my last one. <laughs> and uh, on behalf of everybody, Chris, fantastic show every week for 10 years. What a great job you've done. Everyone give Chris a uh, big Monday Night Live round of applause. And Chris, just remind people, how do they tune into the show? Yeah, it's the Business Elevation Show. If you just Google Business Elevation Show uh, and it's on, or Voice America or Chris Cooper, you will, you will get to me. So voiceamerica.com, um, you can... It would also work and you can find the show and there is 425 hours of shows in the archive and they're all available for free. And you've Derek inspired... Arden preached on two of them, I think. Uh, well, I think it might have been three, Chris, but I don't remember getting the check for the third one. So it's probably well, still well, in the post I'm... like, uh, <laughs> like, all, like all the others. <laughs> I have to say, Chris has interviewed some real superstars like Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup for the Soul and all sorts of people he's got to hold of. And I have an ambition to get some of these people on the show as well. That's absolutely brilliant. Now, I'd like to go to Texas, Tim. Texas, Tim, the rules are 90 seconds. I forgot to tell Chris that because I only asked him to come on the show 45 minutes ago. So he didn't get one of my really good briefings. Are you there, Tim? I am. I am. And in 90 seconds, you mentioned uh, everybody is overwhelmed by their to-do list. I strongly suggest this would be a good time to make a to-don't list. What do you have to let go of in order to get a grip? Um, and Godfrey put something that is very important. If you do something in your own handwriting, it goes to the memory part of your brain. Don't type it. Don't keyboard it. 
write it. I will also say the quality of the information that you get is based on the quality of the questions you ask. So develop better questions. Um, and I'd be happy to send anybody 50 questions if they're in business. The 50 questions that I put together, I actually have 99, um, but I will send them to anybody that asked him at timdurkin.com. Um, so big question is, what do you have to let go of in order to get a grip? It's time to let go. That's brilliant, Tim. Absolutely brilliant. I was telling someone this morning about uh, schools have just gone back here and I was saying, do yeah, children these there. days use an iPad to make notes or do they use handwriting? And we had a big discussion whether they actually get taught to handwrite properly in schools. And I didn't know the answer to that question. But handwriting has been removed from American schools. All the, the, the millennials, you can see, they don't use handwriting, Palmer method, they, they print. Um, now there are some private schools that are putting handwriting in, back in, but um, there are no handwriting classes. So anybody under the age of 30 in the US um, prints. And considering you open up more um, neurons in your brain if you write in your, make notes in your own handwriting, that's scary. Overwhelming and, uh, scientific evidence supports that, Derek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can okay. confirm that they do teach handwriting in the UK school still. Well, that's good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, and it's interesting. Okay, let's keep going because um, we've got a lot to get through. Amy Rowlinson, are you there, Amy? What have you uh, picked up over the last uh, uh, four weeks? Well, thank you very much, Derek. I would like to say that I took some action after David Heiner came on the show. And it, I think it was Tim Durkin who recommended Loving What Is by Byron Katie. So I went off and read that. And then that took me off on a several other book journeys, reading some Adlerian psychology with, which was all about the courage to be disliked and the courage to be happy, written by Fumitaka Koga and Ichiro Kishimi. So I've been on a bit of a, a reading binge this summer because I've been reading On Writing by Stephen King, which is fascinating to learn the craft. And it was a bit of a memoir as well about what he has to say about writing and various other things, How to Listen by Katie Columbus, Opportunity by Rob Moore and Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. So I've been really reading but what I've also done is I qualified as my master NLP practitioner and also master coach. And part of that is to do some work on the values levels. So not just your values, but values levels, which was created through the work of Dr. Claire Graves, which is absolutely fascinating. And it's understanding more about the levels that people are operating with and also working with companies to understand how they are coming through in their individuals and also where they're working from, from their value levels perspective. And it's really changed my focus on why it's really changed my filters and understanding where people are coming from so knowing your values as, as a lot of people focus on their own core values but do you know the values of others and how that affects the way that they approach their work in business which has been really interesting so that's what my focus has been on and celebrating 200 episodes of focus on why in the last couple of weeks. congratulations uh, to that amy and uh, amy can i ask you. you a personal question Sure. Did you have any time to go on holiday with your family after reading? I did. All that? I did. And do you know what? That has been a really important part. I actually had three weeks of August off and it's been fam absolutely fabulous. And what I've done coming back is compartmentalized my diary. I have broken it down into chunks and I've really time protected. And I'm now only working a sort of shorter four day week but having two hour breaks at lunchtime to exercise and to ensure I'm really down tooling and just really enjoying more about life. But yes, I made it out to see my father and my brother in France. I've made it up to see my grandmother and my mother up in Stratford Haven. And I have been absolutely loving it. It was a bit of a, a crash back to reality today to, to be on Zoom again. Fantastic. Great to see you. And I'm pleased you've done that. And I think we should have a session on, uh on NLP, one or two of us that are practitioners of uh, NLP, just talking about the practicalities of it. Uh, because I put NLP- really in, valuable. Yeah, I put NLP in my newsletter last week and someone wrote me a rather rude uh, note about, uh, about NLP, which I, uh, I've crossed them. They've, um, they've disappeared off my newsletter list because frankly, it was totally uh, 
out of order but um, well but, a lot of people say it's nothing like psychology that's what it stands for yeah. but do you know it's i think it's a really interesting because as with all of these tools it's how you apply them in your work Absolutely. and it's it's if it's going to benefit you or others then fabulous 100 percent. i think we'll switch down now to uh, down to the deepest darkest dorset to uh, godfrey and see what uh, godfrey's picked up in that uh, 150 people village that he lives in with one pub Thank you, Derek. Well, um, I'm going to be a little bit different. And you asked, uh, what have I done in the last four or five weeks? And I've been helping my daughter. And our focus as a group is, is quite a bit of helping young people. My daughter currently is volunteering her time as chair of the fundraising board for the Prince's Trust. That is Prince Charles and his charitable organisation. And they're focusing at the moment on young girls and women between the age of 16 and 25, because during the pandemic, 1.5 million women in this category have lost their income. 57% of young women say they're worried about their mental health. 35% of young female parents skip their meals to help their children. And the Education Institute research shows that during this period, girls have seen far lower levels of well-being and self-esteem than the equivalent age group of boys. So there's a focus on this and it's a bit of fun and I'll be advertising it nearer the time. But in the week, 11th to 17th of October, I'm going to invite you all to take part in the brilliant breakfast and that can be as easy as inviting a few mates round for coffee and croissant, going to a cafe for a full fryer, uh, getting your local coffee shop to take 20p off each cup of coffee in this period. Um, it might be going to uh, have a full stack of pancakes, Tim and Janice, um, but it can be as easy or as big as you want. And during this week, to have a bit of fun, and ask for some donations and make a bit of money. Uh, five pounds, for example, can pay for a reading module to teach somebody how to start getting an English qualification. 10 pounds can teach one young woman how to budget and manage their family income. 25 pounds can help an isolated young woman travel to a course for training and improving herself. And this was interesting, I hadn't thought of this, but 50 pounds, can ensure a young woman can travel to work for a month before she gets her first salary check, which is a real problem, I understand. So uh, it's not a lot of money. We can each put in a fiver or as much as we can. And I am going to be advertising this because having spoken to my daughter, I really see where the problem is. And we're all here to help young women particularly who are in the vulnerable and disadvantaged category. So with no apology for the plug, that's it from me in Darkest Dorset. And I will be asking Derek to email some blurb around to all of you. Thanks very much. It'll be an absolute pleasure, Godfrey. And just to tell you for how long I've known Godfrey, um, I've been the privilege to be uh, Zoe's uh, godfather, which is uh, Godfrey's... Um, Godfrey's daughter. Godfrey, why don't you get Zoe on here for five minutes with you? How about that as a challenge? These, uh, these worrying, these things are very worrying. And uh, what I'd like to do now is to bring Janice Litvin on, who's our, uh, who's our guest next week, who's written this fantastic book, Banish Burnout Toolkit, because Janice is very, very concerned about uh, burnout, stress, and what people are going through. Janice, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much, Derek. So in answer to your original question, what I've been doing and learning the last month and actually the whole last 18 months, and you brought it up about to-do lists, um, I have figured out several lessons. First of all, if I'm going to talk about stress and helping people banish burnout, I need to get my own house in order. So I wake up in the morning worrying, worrying, worrying about the biggest to-do list, the biggest item on my to-do list. And a few, I've learned a few things. Number one, 
to only have three major items on my to-do list for a day. And after I complete those three, not to just keep looking for more things to work on, but to stop and acknowledge for myself, yay, I got those big three things done. The brain loves a completion. And so I like to tell people to find your happy moments and look for ways to celebrate little tiny wins throughout the day so we can build more joy into our lives. The other thing about, uh, uh, someone else talked about blocking the calendar. Um, I've also learned to block my calendar. As all of you know, in the early days of the pandemic, we were all taking so many Zoom calls and meeting people and then having more individual offline Zoom meetings, which I love. But my whole day was thrown out of whack because I never had enough time to get things done. And then I was working till 11 o'clock at night. My husband said, we never see you anymore. You're always in that home office. And so now I've learned to block <clears throat> chunks of time on my calendar. I even went to the trouble to set up Calendly, which is a little bit of a pain in the neck, but I have done that. And so I block minimum two and hopefully four hours a day with no meetings so that I can actually feel I can get some creativity going and accomplish some of my bigger goals, which is preparing my presentations. Fantastic, Janice. And we're really looking forward to your session next week. I think you and I are having a rehearsal on Thursday, so that will be fantastic. Yes. And, uh, you know, thank you for joining us from San Francisco, I think. Is it San Francisco? Yes, I'm right outside San Francisco. Yes, Patricia Fripp's neighbor <laughs> by 25 miles. <laughs> by 25 miles. <laughs> Neighbors in the UK are just down the road, actually, about, yeah. <laughs> uh, about 10 yards. It's, uh, it's a bit different. Now we'll switch to uh, Martin Cairns if he's there. Martin in Leicester. Leicester's been one of the cities that's really been badly hit by the pandemic and they've been in lockdown for a, um, for a long period. Martin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, we've been in lockdown off and on since March of last year. So <clears throat> we're very used to it. A um, couple of things, Derek. The first one coincidentally involves Arsenal because you mentioned them at the outset. And I understand uh, that... Um, Mikel Arteta, who, for those who of you don't know, is the Arsenal manager, is also very keen on to-do lists. Uh, and they're sort of the basis of his, of his approach to management. At the start of the season, he decided to pick the two key things, because to-do lists can get very long, uh, and you end up doing none of them. He picked two key things. The first to-do list was to ensure that his team didn't concede any goals. And the second to-do item was that they scored a goal. Because if you don't concede and you score, you're going to win every game. Unfortunately, they're both still on his to-do list. <laughs> because they've played three games and not achieved either of them. Uh, so that's one version of a to-do list. But on a more serious note, uh, certainly from a personal point of view, um, in about uh, three weeks ago, one of my younger brothers, of which I have two, uh, has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and um, we've seen the signs for some considerable time but you always hope that uh, the experts have uh, overstated it or got it wrong or whatever <clears throat> so uh, being his big brother um, it brings a responsibility and uh, he's a very keen soccer player as we both were when we were younger uh, and there's a thing in this country called walking football and it's for us older people who find even walking a bit difficult, but um, it's walking, it's very, very popular. Obviously it's for the older uh, men and women, I think women are involved in it these days. Uh, and uh, we turn up once a week on a Wednesday and we play for an hour uh, in three 20 minute sessions. And it really is an eye opener. Um, some of the things that these blokes overcome just to play football, is, uh, is really inspiring. So um, that's my key lesson for the, for the time we've been off screen. Fantastic, Martin, thanks for that. And uh, now I'm gonna to turn to Nigel Kirby because Nigel's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, our guest in two weeks time, who Tim said we should try and get on. And Nigel uh, took it away from me and went for it and has got Marcus Dimbleby on about red team thinking. So tell, tell us a bit about that, Nigel. Right. Well, red team thinking is a 
method whereby a team effectively challenges everything that is contained within strategy documents because contained within those documents are preconceived biases there's a lot of assumptions so the idea of the red team is to use various tools and techniques to effectively probe and ask some open questions like what would be the consequences if that assumption didn't come to pass or uh, what would happen if xyz were to be true that you have stated as an assumption so the tools and techniques help to stress test the strategies to strengthen plans identify unseen threats and also to look at um, unseen or missed opportunities and um, our guests are going to be coming from the originators of red team thinking that started out from the American military at Fort Leavenworth and uh, Marcus Dimbleby is a former squadron leader and was responsible for the security of the uh, Olympic Games in terms of air control so he's going to come on so i don't want to spoil and steal too much of his thunder but basically everybody on this call i can guarantee that somewhere along a conversation that you will have with clients or future clients the tools and techniques of red team thinking will kick in um, i was so convinced that i actually enrolled on the boot camp which i did the uh last week and I was even further impressed. I went to re-enlist and I've now signed up to do the uh, masterclass, which is a series of um, more specialised uh, modules. I've also been listening to the Thought Leader um, podcast, which uh, Bryce Hoffman, who is the uh, instigator of Red Team Thinking, and listening to some of the uh, influential speakers one of which was uh, Gary Klein, and he came up with the idea of the pre-mortem. So most organisations look backwards. After it's all gone wrong, they look back and find out what actually went wrong. The idea of the pre-mortem is to say, it's gone wrong, you don't state why, but you allow the team to imagine the consequences and possibilities so hopefully through that introspection, you can come up with creative ways to um, avoid that scenario from happening. And if it does happen, then you are aware of some of the issues. Alan Mullally, who was the saviour of Ford and listening to some of the inspirational ways that he turned a failing company into a profitable company, and also David Snowden, who's come up with the Kinevin framework. And essentially the Kinevin framework is a simple way to overlay, to identify whether you have a complex or simple uh, challenge. And there are various tools and techniques to then use depending on where you are within that Kinevin framework. I'm gonna stop you there, Nigel, because of the time and yep. also, um... I think the most important thing between you and I is to for everyone to get as many people on the program as possible because um, you know as Tim said uh, to us from Texas this is really cutting edge leading uh, information. But I took I, negotiating directly from you Derek. Absolutely yeah. and um, Nigel used the uh, used the old maxim of uh, negotiating if you don't ask you don't get and he asked and uh, Marcus was very keen to, to come on the program wasn't he very keen and we had a day we had a chat with him last week and uh wow I, Derek, to... I, I just have to add that i cannot overstate what a tremendous get that getting doc uh marcus uh, dimbleby in the show is it's uh it's one of the two leading thinkers on this subject that is absolutely brilliantly well timed and as evidence, um, you can see in the Afghanistan debacle um, that there was no red team thinking done because President Trump got rid of the red team thinking section of the U.S. military because he found it confusing. Um, but it, it's dem demonstrably evident that there was no red team thinking 
in the evacuation uh, of the Americans and the American allies. So, uh, Nigel, hats off to you, sir. That's a great get. And believe me, everybody needs to think of red team thinking and, and go to this session. Looking forward to it. Okay, guys, I'm, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to put you into uh, breakout rooms now just for uh, seven minutes. On the flip chart, if you can see it, is just to discuss something that you've learned over the last four weeks, something you've relearned. You know, I'm passionate about relearning. We take in so much information and yet we forget so much that we need to be reminded of it or something you went wow on and you went, wow, I need to put that into action straight away. I've not been doing that and I should have been doing it. So um, seven minutes, seven breakout rooms, into the breakout rooms and uh, just go for it. And I'll see you back here in uh, seven minutes. Welcome back to everybody on Monday, Monday Night Live, the first session in September. And now we're going to hear the feedback from the breakout rooms on what people learned, what they relearned or what they went wow to. So uh, off we go. Which group shall we start with? Um, I see Heather Wright smiling at me. So uh, over to you, Heather. What have you got to tell us? I don't know whether I was appointed spokesperson for our group because I accidentally left halfway through a sentence. I, I, what I was trying to click was get rid of box and I clicked leave and I was halfway through a sentence. Uh, but at the time we were talking about things that we had learned. Um, and, but we were, I was just, as I was saying it, um, uh, one, of our, one of our team members had said they'd been doing some marketing and had a zero response uh, and, and hadn't therefore learned anything by it. And I was just about to say, you know, sometimes the thing we learn is only that we're a, we're a minor part away you know, a quarter turn of a screw makes something work or not work. So it may not be that it was completely wrong. So we've got to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, but I don't feel that, like I should be the spokesperson. Chris Cooper actually was better at voicing what he had learned than I was. So I'm going to pass that book. This seems to be a real delegation round. Should we go to another group uh, first and then we'll come back? Uh, poor old Chris didn't even know he was coming on the show till I twisted his arm uh, 45 minutes uh, before. Who wants to uh, go next? Who's going to wave at me? That looks like Gabby waving and then Paul. Hello. Lovely to see all your lovely faces. Um, so we had um, Grace talked about decluttering, which is just so wonderful and reconnecting with things and creating more space in her life. Um, we had Mary talking about the importance of being outdoors and just enjoying the small things. You know, it doesn't have to be great big things. It can be the small things. Um, and uh, gardening was something that we were talking about can be very, very therapeutic, as Derek will know from his potato patch ramblings that come through. Um, and I was talking about just doing some, a small thing towards your goal, towards your, your big thing, um, and just moving things on on a daily basis. It doesn't matter how small a step makes a big difference. Thanks, Gabby. Um, Paul, in the Turks and Caicos Islands, just for those that uh, don't really believe he's uh, in Sutton, he's uh, in the sunshine. Well, it's absolutely true, but it's not dark. It's, uh, this is the background that I'm using now. It's, uh, in, it's uh, well, 12.50 in, in the afternoon. Anyway, just very quickly, I, I started off and it, it created quite a bit of a discussion, really. I, I'm, I'm presently working on uh, preparing for a piece of work that I've got to do uh, through a podcast, I've been invited to, to join in on a podcast. And what came up is uh, the, the impact of bias in, on the work. Well, now, as, as many of you know, my, my specialism is around uh, anti-money laundering and the fight against financial crime. There is one particular area which uh, the private sector, which we all put in as uh, the banks and such like, they're required to report what we call suspicious activity to law enforcement. Um, the, the issue is around, that, that made me think this, there's only 1% of financial crimes are fi uh, uh, reported as solving um, the, the, uh, because of the suspicious activity of our being solved from the suspicious activity report. So this one person who's got to make the decision as to whether they should be reporting to law enforcement uh, and, uh, and why that's such an important role. 
and that led me to this whole point about bias and, and uh, you know how people think and what make their mind up well he's a wealthy man or or well everybody knows he's got money or well yes he you know i know him he's he's a good guy and and all this um and uh it just the more i've scratched the surface because it's only one component of the piece of work i'm doing but the more i scratch the surface it's just absolutely fascinating it, i mean it starts in our childhood really by bias and we don't realize and it's just there and it goes on and on and on, and, and some things we'll just never forget. Okay, thanks, Paul. The others, uh, the NLPers, will have a view on some of this as well. But there's all sorts of uh, biases. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, who wants to go next? Who's waving next? Amy, you nearly waved then. That was nearly a wave, but we'll go to Nigel. Right. We had a really interesting um, discussion, and Christine made the point that we need to praise people we really don't gain anything by um, being critical and the importance to round, surround yourself with positive people. And Christine used the example of her Nordic uh, walking. She's um, worked with two separate groups. One, shall we say, a highly positive, and one group a highly negative. And needless to say that Christine looks forward to walking with the highly positive people so it reinforces healthy mind, healthy body, surround yourself with positive, forward thinking people, leave the negative people behind and they can moan and groan whilst you move forward with positive people. Absolutely. And uh, one of the books I've been rereading re is Swim with the Sharks Without Getting Eaten by, uh, by uh, Harvey McKay, who I was privileged to meet in the States. And Harvey says, I don't mix with anybody that's negative under any circumstances. They're off my Christmas card list. I don't talk to them. I'm just not interested in people whinging and moaning. And I haven't had to really ring the bell today, have I, with any whinging and moaning. So somebody better have a whinge in a minute because I'm feeling a bit, um, a bit uh, lost. Uh, who's, who's next? Who's going to wave at me next? That's John Lisby down in Southampton. You need to unmute, John. Yeah, I was, it's only a quick one. I was just going to thank you, Derek. It's not often I do that, but I actually read your email yesterday or this morning about the sales tips. And there were five sales tips, and I used one today, and that was the um, talk to a potential client as if you've already been appointed. And I found that quite fun, and I haven't been appointed yet, but I think I will be. But uh, I just thought I'd say thank you very much. Well, first of all, it's not thanks to me, it's thanks to our friend Patricia, Patricia Fripp, because she sent them to me last week. And she said to me, Derek, this is unashamed marketing by me, uh, blowing my own trumpet. I know you can't do that in the UK because we can't. If we do it, we're just big heads. And so um, I, I passed that on. John, how did, how did you do it? You just, just use language like... We're yes, when I'm, yes, when... When we're doing this together, we, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, no, I see. Age of what I'll be doing is, yeah. As we work together, this is what we're yeah. doing. And in the second month, I'll be doing this, and I'll need you all to, yeah, that sort of language. And they were all, uh, they were, when I say all, there are only two on the call, but um, there was a lot of nodding, and um, they were with me in month two. So, um, yeah. I'm not, them, any, I'm not paying any commission, and uh, you shouldn't just pass the glory straight to uh, someone else. I mean, there's very little new thought. We always take other people's thoughts and then combine them with, combine them to create something that we say is a new thought. But it's um, really taking two old ideas and then putting them together that creates a new thought. Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? Huge you know. now. That's the, uh, that's the relearning bit, isn't it? And putting it into a different uh, context or to a different package. I totally agree with you. Uh, there's nothing new, really, is there? That's, uh, um, I can't claim there's anything new in my book, but it's my take on, on it and what's uh, worked, worked for me. I thought I'd better give that uh, praise to uh, Patricia Fripp before Janice Litvin tells her that I didn't give her any praise. So I didn't want to be in big, big trouble there, Janice, but it's our secret, okay? <laughs> uh, 
Okay, who, who's next? Um, Rachel. You need to unmute, Rachel. I'll press the space bar. It worked last time. Oh, it does work. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that. Brilliant. Um, okay, so uh, Martin learned that anything is possible, that if he wants to learn to build a brick wall, he can. And he can. He can put his mind to it. Um, I learned about uh, a course on email ninja about handling your emails better, which actually comes back to something I relearned about how important it is to allocate proper space for things that need doing and not to let the emails rule your life because you can just lose a day to just firefighting emails and not get anything done. It's so important to get those projects done, those tasks, those main key tasks you want to get done and not get bogged down with emails. Um, Something that Chris relearned was that despite the pandemic, people are really friendly. People are nice. You go out, he's been going around people's gardens, looking at them having cups of tea and thought how nice people are. And there's been a few wow factors as well. So um, Chris dropped his daughter off at university, which is a big milestone. And Martin got some social contact with his son. So they've had some big wow moments. Um, my daughter goes off to senior school on Wednesday. So that will be my wow moment coming up. Fantastic. No, brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Who's next? Looking around. Um, let's have a look. Um, is, that, is that you, Tim, waving at me? You made a mistake of moving, so... No. Okay. But Michael O'Hara and Jill English have something. Okay, brilliant. Um, we'll go to Jill first, then, shall we? You there, Jill? I am. So as Michael's queued up, so um, I'll, I'll let Michael say what um, uh, I kind of spun off a little bit from what Michael said. Uh, and I relearned how important it is to put yourself in the other person's shoes and set things out for their benefit, not for my benefit. So assume that they may not know what the context is. If you want to have a meeting with them, tell them exactly why and what questions you're going to be asked asking so that they can at least get their head in the right space and do whatever prep they need to do in advance. Just be a bit thoughtful about um, putting the other person's needs first. You can't always ask them what they want, but you can have a good stab at guessing and, and, and at least make it possible that they can ask you if there is anything else. Sure, sure. I, I had an interview with a guy called Andrew Priestley who uh, has written a book, Is This About Me or You? And those of you that know me well know that I just, just buy everybody's book and look for one point to take from it and, uh, and, and away we go. And, you know, it seems to me that there's so many people saying we've got to put ourselves in the other person's shoes, but it's actually so difficult to do it. It is really, which is why I asked John Lisby how, how he did it. It really is because who's the most important person in the world? It's us. So we go to that default position. Fantastic, Jill. And is Michael O'Hara next? Are you next, Michael, up there in Glasgow? Derek, I think that on the same tone as Joe was saying, it was about trying to find out um, what the other person is really going through. So we all answer that question of how you're doing, I'm fine, and move on. Are they fine? Um, perhaps uh, after an appropriate amount of time, you can dig a little bit deeper. Everybody's carrying a, a cross of one sort of another. How can you help them? Yeah. And sometimes uh, we, we use the analogy of the, the St. Vincent de Paul Society and using business skills uh, in, in uh, human helping others. And uh, it's, it's getting past that uh, normal answer of, yes, I'm fine. Uh, are, are you really fine? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I guess that's, that's something which we're relearning. Uh, maybe some of us have, have forgotten uh, how to, how to, really find out what's going on in the other person's shoes. Only by finding out can we help them. Absolutely. I was taught about 20 years ago by Peter Thompson that fine stood for feeling inwardly negative every day. And it is one of those things that people say, oh, I'm fine, you know, but uh, it's the, with the tonality of fine, I think it uh, very often is feeling inwardly negative every day. The problem is that, um, do we really mean it when we ask people how they are? That's the problem, isn't it? Uh, um, whereas, um, again, Brian Tracy taught me to say, uh, fantastic, thank you for asking, because that gets a really different response when you answer answer that, but as you say, finding out. So, Tim? 
Derek, I work a lot in healthcare and we have a lot of COVID fatigue. Um, approximately 50% of our nurses plan on leaving the profession. Um, and so the leaders have been taught in the US, the leaders of hospitals, to ask that question this way. How are you doing? How are you really doing? By repeating the words, how are you doing? How are you really doing? Um, you're going to get the good answer. You're going to get the truth answer right away. Um, and I, I've tried that a couple of times. Normally, I'd get fine. But if I say really doing, I'll say I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. I have to hire somebody to chew my food. <laughs> Tim, you do have some extraordinary sayings. I try and write them down as quick as I can. Good job I'm recording this. I have to get someone to chew my food. I can't put that in next week's newsletter. I'll get, uh, I'll get ripped to shreds. Um, fantastic, thank you. I think we got time for Tim, one. Can I, Tim, can I apply for that job, please? Doing <laughs> your food. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Guys, um, we're... Um, I'm going to close it down now and then I'll stay on as long as you like for a chat about anything, ask any questions. But uh, just uh, thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, next week, we've got uh, the lovely Janice Litvin. Give us a wave, Janice. Uh, uh, the week after, we've got, um, we've got Marcus Dimbleby. And the week after that, we've got Tracy Hooper from, from Seattle. Words that sell, words that tell. Um, and that's the uh, September lineup. So I look forward to seeing you all. If you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on the podcast channel, please do get in contact. Please ask any questions you like. And it's been a delight to see everybody. So big wave from everybody and uh, see you next week. <laughs>